China is planning a Mars sample return mission. Webb tracks water moving towards planets, and the Hubble tension has gotten even more tense. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. We've got samples from a lot of places around the solar system. Think about the samples that came from the moon. We've got samples from asteroids. But the thing that we don't have, the thing we really want, is a sample from Mars. Now, this is in the works. NASA and the European Space Agency are working together. They're building their Mars sample return mission. And in fact, this process has already started with the Perseverance rover. It is crawling across the surface of Mars. It's finding interesting locations. It is extracting core samples. It's putting them into its sample collection. It's it's holding them deep inside, and it's going to meet up with a future NASA ESA mission, give over the samples, and then it will fly them back to Earth, and we will finally have pieces of Mars. But there is another group that is working on a Mars sample return mission, and that's the Chinese. They have been building up to this capability of delivering samples from Mars. When you think about the Chang'e 5 mission that landed on the moon, they retrieved samples from the moon and they brought them back to Earth. And then we think about the Tianwen mission, where they sent a lander and a rover to the surface of Mars and have demonstrated they can land payloads with accuracy on Mars, they can move around, they can rove. All the pieces are in place to now develop a Mars sample return mission. The Chinese Space Agency has said this is probably going to be Tianwen 3, and the plan is to launch this in 2028 and retrieve the samples back to Earth by 2031. And this is earlier by a couple of years than what the NASA ESA mission is planning to do. And in fact, the NASA ESA mission is, is kind of up in the air right now. There are concerns about the size of the budget, the concerns about the timelines, and so it could be that that mission gets pushed back a little farther. We kind of don't know. As part of this process, the Chinese have been simulating the atmospheric conditions around where their mission is going to be landing. And so based on that, they'll be able to figure out exactly what will be the requirements of their sample return mission. Now, this won't be like the NASA ESA mission where they're going to get all of these carefully chosen samples from several kilometers of journey by the Perseverance rover. They're going to be collecting their samples in one spot where the lander is, and then they're going to be sending that back to Earth. But still, like whether NASA ESA does it, whether the Chinese do it, like we are really close to finally getting some fresh samples from Mars back here on Earth to study. What's going to be in them? The Oort cloud could be more active than we thought. We know of two interstellar objects, Oumuamua and Borisov. And Oumuamua was the first one. It was this very strange cigar-shaped object. Maybe it's an asteroid, maybe it's a comet. Kind of mysterious. Borisov is just like straight up comet that passed through the solar system. Both Oumuamua and Borisov were on what are called hyperbolic trajectories, which means that they are going to come through the solar system, but then they're going to leave again. While regular asteroids and comets, they move in elliptical trajectories within the solar system. And so they're trapped in the gravitational well around the sun. Astronomers have seen meteors on interstellar trajectories. They were able to track the actual path that a meteor took as it came into the atmosphere. And they were able to chart that, in fact, this was coming in on an interstellar trajectory. Does this mean that there could be interstellar meteorites somewhere on Earth? Maybe, but maybe not. So a new paper suggests that, in fact, some of the interstellar meteors might not have been interstellar at all, but actually came from the Oort cloud. Typically, objects that come from the Oort cloud, they're already trapped by the gravitational wave of the sun. They're going to be just going in orbit around the sun, and they're not going to be coming or leaving the solar system. But if one of these objects has like a three body interaction with another Oort cloud object or a Kuiper belt object or a planet, then it can be kicked into a trajectory that will then take it out of the solar system. And so their theory says that, in fact, you could explain some of these interstellar meteors as not being interstellar at all, but they are actually Oort cloud objects that were kicked into these trajectories. And if so, then that maybe that means that some of the other objects, maybe even Oumuamua and Borisov, aren't interstellar, that they actually came from the Oort cloud, but went through some kind of three-body interaction. And so we're not sure how many objects are actually coming from interstellar locations. But if we could get our hands on a piece of an interstellar object, we could learn about another star system. So I'm going to talk about this some more at the end of this episode, so stick around for that. A unique supernova remnant discovered by an amateur astronomer. 
In 2023, amateur astronomer Dana Patrick was looking through archival data from the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE. And the WISE telescope is very cool. It's designed to look for objects in the infrared spectrum. And one of its tasks was to scan the environment around the solar system to see if, like, does the sun have a companion brown dwarf, or is there like a really large, like a Jupiter-sized object out in the Oort cloud. And based on the WISE data, the answer is no, uh, the Sun is alone. But they were able to find lots of brown dwarfs, and it also found lots of asteroids and other objects. And so Dana was looking through some of this archival data and noticed a supernova remnant, a weird little nebula that was visible in the infrared, but it wasn't that obvious in the visible light. This was unusual. Dana marked this, called it PA30. It was initially thought that it might be a planetary nebula, but then later on astronomers realized, no, this is a supernova remnant. And astronomers were able to match this supernova remnant to a supernova that was seen in the sky in 1181 CE, so 1181 AD. It was noted by Chinese astronomers in their records. And in fact, you know, it would have been very bright. People around the world would have seen this very bright star appear in the sky, last for a few weeks before it faded away. And doing follow-on observations, astronomers realized that this is a very special kind of supernova. So it's called a Type 1A X. Now the Type 1A should give you a bit of a hint. A Type 1A supernova is when a white dwarf has been feeding material from a partner star. When it reaches 1.4 times the mass of the sun, it detonates, completely explodes and disappears. And astronomers use that as a way to measure distance in the universe. A Type 1A X is thought to be a collision between two white dwarf stars. And so this very rare supernova remnant discovered by an amateur astronomer in archival data ended up being one of the most important recent supernova discoveries. And it was also seen and tied to a historical event. Like it's all such a cool story, all connected together. There's so much value in looking through this archival data. Every week, we put up a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story of the week. And this week was no surprise, it was the new photos from the Euclid mission. And I totally agree, they were amazing. I'm really excited about the Euclid mission. So if you want to vote, we put up a new vote at the end of every Space Bites. Go ahead, you'll see it show up in your YouTube feed. You can go to the community tab to specifically go and join the vote. And if you want a better chance of seeing it, of course, subscribe to the channel, click on the notification bell, and you'll get it when the next one comes out. Webb sees water being delivered to planets. One of the long-standing questions in astronomy is where did the Earth get its water? And you know, you would think that, okay, the Earth got its water when it got all of its rocks and its metal and all of the various gases and dust and stuff that was in the solar system. But the problem is that when the sun fully ignited and started to blast out radiation into its environment, any volatiles, any water would have evaporated away. And when you think about the moon, like the moon is exposed, we don't see water on the surface of the moon. Yet yeah, there is some water in the shadowed craters where they're protected from the sunlight, but any water that just sits on the surface of the moon would be completely evaporated. And so where did the Earth get its water from? And so it was assumed that some mechanism delivered this water after this fact, like maybe comets or asteroids crashed into the Earth and delivered all that water and carbon and other things that it needed. But another theory is called the icy pebbles theory. And that is, is that small pebbles of rock coated in water ice that formed out in the outer reaches of the solar system moved inward and eventually made their way into the inner solar system, were able to transfer their water to the Earth before it all got evaporated by the sun. And so to confirm this theory, the James Webb Space Telescope was able to observe a protoplanetary disk that had various amounts of water on small pebble-sized grains of material in the system, and they were being shifted into the inner solar system. So it's like a beautiful confirmation of this one theory. So it's not case closed, but I think we're getting really close to saying the Earth got its water by icy pebbles migrating inward after the Earth formed, which is amazing. So thanks, Webb. The lunar swirl mystery deepens. Another mystery. <laughs> 
today's episode is all about mysteries. Um, but there are these features on the moon called lunar swirls, and they really look like, like swirly shapes on the moon. And what they appear to be is some kind of interaction between the sun's solar wind, which is charged particles hitting the surface of the moon, with pockets of magnetism on the moon that are shifting the, the location. We think about the Earth, we have this giant magnetosphere, and as the solar wind tries to hit the Earth, it gets channeled down the poles and we see the auroras and we get protected from that radiation. The Moon doesn't have a global magnetosphere, but it does have little pockets of magnetism. And so it's thought that bits of the Moon are being protected. And so when you see these swirls, these lighter areas, they're being hit less by the solar wind than the darker areas. And the assumption was that this was just the magnetosphere of the Moon that had nothing to do with the topology, the, the features, the craters, mountains, and things on the Moon. Well, not so fast. Astronomers have found that in fact there are lower elevation sections of the Moon that seem to have lunar swirls associated with them. And so is it that the lower features on the Moon have more magnetic material and a more powerful magnetosphere? Is it that somehow the lower elevation impacts how these lunar swirls are created? No answers, more questions, but it's interesting to see this new insight into it. And speaking of the Moon, we've talked about how regolith on the Moon is a big problem. And not just for astronauts who are walking around on the surface of the Moon, but when a spacecraft lands on the Moon, it kicks up a cloud of regolith. Now, there's no atmosphere on the Moon, and so this regolith isn't stopped by the atmosphere. The gravity is lower on the Moon, and so this regolith can be kicked up into much higher trajectories. In fact, it can go into orbit around the Moon. When a spacecraft lands on the Moon, it could kick enough regolith into orbit that it's actually like a hazard for other satellites and other landers that are in the vicinity. And so it's really important to understand, like, what is the environmental effect of like what happens when a lander touches down on the Moon? So NASA ran a supercomputer simulation where they took the Apollo 12 lunar lander and they simulated its landing, the exhaust plumes coming down, hitting the regolith, kicking up material, and then they matched that to the actual results from the Apollo 12 lunar lander to see how well the simulations work to that. And then they can use that to extrapolate when you've got like what's going to happen when Starship lands on the moon, what's going to happen when Blue Origins lander lands on the moon. And we can sort of work out what is the optimal way to land on the moon and not cause some kind of risk to other spacecraft in the area. Now, if you like the work that we do, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? This allows us to be a completely independent space reporting agency. We have more than a dozen writers on the team. We have video editors, audio editors. It's a big team, and yet we're able to support everybody through our patrons. It's not just about supporting independent space news. We give you benefits if you join our Patreon. You get no ads on the Universe Today website for life. You get behind the scenes information. You get to see our stuff early. And we do a behind the scenes Q&A just for the patrons. Now, you don't have to donate to join our Patreon. There is a free tier that you can join where you still get access to a lot of the content that we produce. If you want to avoid the YouTube ads, the version we release to the patrons, has no ads in it. So there are other benefits. So if you want, go to patreon.com slash universe today and join our Patreon. Either donate or join for free. The Hubble tension gets even more tense. We've talked about the Hubble tension many times here on the channel, you know, the crisis in cosmology. Uh, and this is this measurement that astronomers have done at the expansion rate of the universe. They've measured our galactic neighborhood and measured one value, and then they measure the rate in the cosmic microwave background radiation, and they get two different numbers, and the error bars on those two numbers are so precise and they don't overlap, there is a gap. What's going on? Well, we don't know. But astronomers wondered, is our local environment maybe causing a problem with the measurement in the local environment? The Milky Way is part of the local group of galaxies, and that's part of the Virgo supercluster, and that's part of the Lanakea supercluster. And our overall local group is drifting, like all of the galaxies in this region, towards the sort of general center of mass. And so astronomers wondered, is this drift contributing to the measurements of the Hubble tension? Because if it was, then maybe you could make that tension go away in explanation. Well, they found that there is about a 2 to 3% change in the Hubble tension if you take into account the drift of the local group towards the concentration of mass in the Lanakea supercluster. Well, good news, right? Well, no, because it's the opposite. And so in other words, the Hubble tension gets 2 to 3% worse 
when you account for our interaction with the Lanikea supercluster. So no answers, just another mystery deepens. Yeah, this really is the mystery episode, isn't it? All right, one last story here, and that is that SpaceX has gotten approval from the FAA to launch the SpaceX Starship. This is the one that's gonna use the newly upgraded launch platform. It's got the hot fire separation. It's going to disconnect the super heavy booster from the Starship. And if all goes well, this is gonna blast off on Saturday and go into orbit and demonstrate a safe return of both the booster and Starship back to various landing sites around the Earth. Of course, my plan is to reach out to a couple of my space friends and we'll do some kind of conversation after the successful or unsuccessful launch, talk about what happened, so stay tuned for that. I'm gonna talk about interstellar objects some more, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiblin, Modzo, George, David Giltanan, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I mentioned that we know of two interstellar objects, Oumuamua and Borisov, and if they do come from other star systems, then we really need to study them. There's been many papers that have been proposed that you could still catch up with Oumuamua, study it. It would, you know, every day that goes by, we've got less time and we're gonna need a bigger rocket to be able to make that journey. But can you imagine if we could actually gather a sample from an interstellar object? There's a mission planned by the European Space Agency called the Interstellar Interceptor. And this is gonna be a mission that's gonna loiter out at the Earth-Sun L2 Lagrange point, the same place that Gaia and James Webb are waiting at. And it's gonna wait for a target. And then you've got telescopes on the ground like Vera Rubin that's going to find another interstellar object. And if one is coming in at the right trajectory, then the interceptor will take off and do a flyby of this object and take some pictures as it goes by, do some spectroscopic analysis, and we can get a better sense of what that thing was. At least figure out whether or not it's an alien spacecraft. Now, there's an interview that I did with a researcher that is proposing that you could bolt a very powerful radioisotopic thermoelectric generator to an ion engine, like it's just all engine, and it could achieve delta V rates in the tens, maybe even 100 kilometers per second. And that would be enough velocity to chase down an interstellar object, land on the surface, retrieve a sample, and then bring it home to Earth. And again, we talked about a Mars sample return. Can you imagine interstellar object sample return? How much could we learn about another star system? So I really hope at some point we do this. All right, that's all for this week. We'll see you next week.